By the summer of 1941, the Second World War had been raging for almost two years. Though the United States had thus far avoided being dragged into this escalating global conflict, President Roosevelt's support of the democratic nations in Western Europe, and the rapid breakdown of diplomacy with Imperial Japan, had led many to believe that the US would eventually become involved whether it wanted to or not. It was in the shadow of this looming threat that the US Army Air Corps unveiled their newest aerial weapon. Rolling out from a hangar in Santa Monica was the XB-19, built by the Douglas Aircraft Company, and it was the largest and most capable aircraft in the world. Developed in secrecy for over half a decade, and at extreme cost, the XB-19 could carry an 8-ton bomb load over a range of 5,200 miles, making it the world's first intercontinental bomber. Nothing on this scale had ever been attempted before, and it was claimed that the XB-19's construction had revolutionised the production of large aircraft, encouraged the development of new and advanced engines, and had given the US Army Air Corps the ultimate platform to fight a European air war from American soil. Unsurprisingly, a media frenzy followed the XB-19, leading up to the day of its maiden flight. The Air Corps newsletter of May 5th, 1941, likened the removal of the XB-19 from its factory, after three years of construction, to that of trying to get a boat out of a cellar in which it was built. A metaphor that would culminate half a century later with the boat building machinations of one Jethro Gibbs. And for those unaware of the TV show NCIS, that was a joke, and probably a bad one. The newsletter went on to hail the XB-19 as a tribute to the ingenuity and ability of the men of the Air Corps and the Douglas Aircraft Company. It was a monument to the far-sightedness of the Secretary of War and the Senate and House Military Affairs Committees, who, back in 1936, had approved such an advanced project and voted for the necessary funds to make the proposed airplane a reality. All of this praise was deeply, deeply ironic, as, although the XB-19 was indeed a massive, complex, and innovative machine, it was in fact already obsolete. It was also horribly over budget, it was not the result of far-sightedness, but rather that of abject stubbornness, and it wasn't even going to enter service as an intercontinental bomber. It was going to be used instead as a testbed for the development of future intercontinental bombers. While it was being paraded by the press as the next big bomber for the Air Corps, despite not having even flown yet, contracts had already been signed for the XB-35 and XB-36 prototypes. There was also little mention of the fact that when the XB-19 first rolled out of its specially built hangar, whose doors had to be demolished to get it out, its sheer weight immediately caused cracks to appear on the ground. Or the fact that it was given appalling odds of 13 to 1 that it would even survive its maiden flight, as many thought that even with 2,200 horsepower engines, it was still underpowered. Obviously, there was a bit of media bias towards the whole thing, both on the part of the Air Corps and Douglas itself, whose own newsletter talked up the XB-19 quite excessively. And this is a problem that continues to this day, which is why I want to quickly talk about Ground News, the sponsor of today's video. In the modern world of manipulative algorithms and social media feeds, it can be exceedingly difficult to get a diverse, factual, and impartial news feed. Political and financial motives often pull the strings behind the scenes, and for all of its benefits, social media has allowed an unparalleled spread of misinformation. Ground News lets you sort through this mess by providing a comparison platform where, instead of being fed just the one news article, you are instead given a topic with all of the news articles related to it. I started using this site about eight months ago, and it's brilliant. And for the sake of demonstration and keeping with the theme of experimental bombers, let's pull up the topic covering the new B-21 radar. When you click on the story, you'll be taken to the newsroom. On the right, you'll see some data on how the story is being covered by the media, and on the left, you'll see all of the articles related to the topic. As you scroll down, you'll see all of the news sources reporting on the story, where they fall on the political spectrum, and how factual they are according to ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. 
Ground News also has a methodology page that explains how they calculate the ratings that they assign. Another feature of Ground News is something they call their blind spot articles, which are news topics that have received a heavy focus on one side of the political spectrum. Some of these articles can be a bit sensationalist, but many of them are solid reads that you might have missed because of your own reading preferences. And that is something that Ground News lets you monitor too. It will tell you your reading habits, how many stories you read, whether you have a political reading bias, and much, much more. So if you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events around the world, click on the link below to try Ground News for free, or even subscribe to get access to even more features, and support a small team working to make the news a bit more transparent. So thank you Ground News for sponsoring today's video, and now let's get back to the XB-19. Though technically obsolete by the time of its maiden flight, the XB-19 was not inherently bad, or in any major way poorly designed. For the most part, its obsolescence was due to the glacial pace in which it was developed and built, something not helped by bureaucratic wrangling on the part of the US government, and a reluctance on the part of Donald Douglas to invest any more of his company's finances into what he called a flying money pit. The origins of the XB-19 can be traced back to the mid-1930s, when the US Army Air Corps initiated experimental programs to develop a new generation of long-range heavy bombers. Known as Project A and Project D, they sought out designs for bombers with a range of 5,000 miles and 10,000 miles respectively, and called for bomb loads in excess of 8,800 pounds. First drawn up in 1933, these projects represented a monumental task for the United States aviation industry. At the time, there was nothing in service that could even be classified as a heavy bomber, and the Air Corps' main bomber, the Martin B-10, had a range of just 1,200 miles and a bomb carrying capacity of just 2,260 pounds. Eventually, three manufacturers would rise to the challenge and submit proposals – Boeing, Douglas, and Sikorsky. These designs would receive the designation of XBLR, which stood for Experimental Bomber Long Range. These designs were not all submitted at once, and in fact, Boeing got off to a significant head start, being issued a contract to build their XBLR-1 in August of 1934. This would eventually become known as the XB-15. The commencement of the Boeing project, designed to meet the specifications of Project A, prompted Donald Douglas to task his company with submitting a proposal for the more ambitious Project D. By 1935, the company was enjoying remarkable success. Its DC-2 airliner had been popular, and the new DC-3 was receiving large production orders and was on the verge of national and international greatness. Douglas wanted to mimic this success with military designs, and he saw Project D as the perfect opportunity to both gain favour with the Air Corps and to wipe the eye of his main rival, Boeing. Following discussions with the Air Corps during the first half of the year, Douglas was tasked with completing preliminary plans for a heavy bomber to meet the requirements for Project D. On the 9th of July, the model designation of XBLR-2 was officially given to the Douglas project, and shortly thereafter, a competing design from Sikorsky was approved as the XBLR-3. The design proposal drawn up by Douglas dwarfed anything they had produced before. The aircraft was to be powered by either four or six engines, depending on the power plants available, the fuselage was to be 130 feet long, the wingspan would be in excess of 200 feet, and the aircraft would have an empty weight of at least 80,000 pounds. For comparison's sake, the largest aircraft currently mass-produced by Douglas, the DC-3, was powered by two engines, had a wingspan of just 95 feet, and an empty weight of around 16,800 pounds. Along with the task of designing and building a new aircraft of a scale never yet attempted, there was also the matter of the project's timeline, which was equally as ambitious as the design project itself. Douglas was to have the preliminary design complete by the end of the year, detailed design work was to commence no later than January 31st, 1936, 
A scale mock-up was to be produced for inspection by the Material Division of the Air Corps by mid-year, and the prototype itself was to be complete by no later than March 31st, 1938. Douglas was given a quotation of just under one and a half million dollars to cover the cost of the project, with payment to be made once the aircraft had been completed, flown successfully, and accepted for delivery by the Army Air Corps. Contracts of the time had no provisions for cost overruns, and Douglas was surprised by the modest terms of the contract itself. He had expected to invest at least two million in the project, but the Air Corps wouldn't budge on this point, and the company got to work with their accountants already feeling more than a little uneasy. Three months and $100,000 later, the mock-up of the XBLR2 was already complete. It was then presented to an evaluation team from the Material Division, where, to Douglas's relief, it was deemed superior to a competing design that had been submitted by Sikorsky. This relief, however, would be short-lived. Though the Air Corps were interested in Douglas's design, getting official sanction for their contract to build and finance the prototype was to prove a considerable challenge. Talking about the development of an intercontinental bomber was one thing, but justifying and funding said development was another matter entirely. There simply wasn't enough money, nor enough broad support, to take the XBLR2 project from a drawing board concept to a reality, especially as the Boeing XB-15, which was built for the less ambitious Project A, had already encountered all sorts of difficult and expensive development problems. Because of this, the project sat in limbo for almost two years, and it wasn't until the 22nd of September 1937 that the government was finally in a position to purchase the prototype if it were built. By now, enough time had passed that Douglas had to make multiple modifications to the design to keep up with advances in aviation technology. The biggest change in the design was the power plant. As aircraft rapidly grew bigger in scope, engine development had lagged behind, leading to a lot of large, impressive, but ultimately underpowered designs. The original proposed engines for the XBLR2 had been 850 horsepower Pratt & Whitney twin WASPs, which, according to engineers, would have been just enough to safely get it airborne and flying whilst better engines were still being developed. Then, things had switched to the experimental Allison XV-3420. This 1600 horsepower engine was essentially two V-1710 engines that had been stuck together via a single crankshaft to produce a massive V-24. However, by the end of 1937, this engine was not yet ready, indeed it was being plagued by all sorts of development problems, and Douglas was forced to look for yet another alternative. The alternative engine proved to be the right duplex cyclone. It was a huge 54.8 litre twin row 18 cylinder supercharged radial, and at the time it was rated for 2,200 horsepower at takeoff. This newly developed engine would become the backbone of the United States strategic bomber force, though nobody back then yet knew it, and it took a significant amount of convincing from Douglas before the Air Corps even approved them for use on the XBLR. Once said approval was granted, and the new design was approved, it received the new designation of XB-19. As construction got underway, Donald Douglas had already accepted that the time, resources, and finances required to complete the XB-19 far exceeded the agreement signed with the Air Corps. A lot of this came from lessons being learned with the experimental Douglas DC-4E, which was a large four-engine airliner. Though this project gave Douglas engineers vital experience to put to use on the XB-19, it also highlighted the complexity and cost of building something so huge, and the DC-4E, though itself large, was not at all on the same scale as the XB-19 project. Because of this, just one year into the XB-19's construction, in August of 1938, Donald Douglas decided that he wanted out. The changing political situation in Europe was leading to more demand for small and medium-sized aircraft, and the XB-19 was taking up thousands of man-hours that could be put into work for export orders. Thus, at the end of the month, he formally wrote to the Army Air Corps and recommended the cancellation of the project. Unfortunately for Douglas, his wishes were denied. 
Partly because the Air Corps did not want to suffer the embarrassment of seeing such a project go to waste, and partly because the XB-19 was now being viewed as an experimental testbed, rather than as the prototype for an actual bomber series. It was hoped that the XB-19 would now help to solve many of the problems that faced large bomber construction, so that other projects, those for the B-29, XB-35 and XB-36, could be completed more easily, and, more importantly, at a better cost. The irony of the situation reportedly drove Douglas to such a state of exasperation and rage that the Air Corps was forced to demand weekly construction reports, as they feared he would take men away from the XB-19's assembly line and simply put them to work on other more profitable aircraft instead. Finally, in the second half of 1941, after another two years of construction, over 130 progress reports, and a no doubt concerning increase of Donald Douglas's blood pressure, the XB-19 was almost ready. Douglas would later report that the construction of the prototype had required 500 engineers, technicians and mechanics, 9,000 drawings that could be spread out over a four acre area, 42,000 research and testing hours, 700,000 engineering hours, 1,250,000 shop hours, and most painfully, the expenditure of $2.5 million, putting the whole thing a million over budget. But although the project was horrifically behind schedule, over budget, and in the eyes of its creators, unnecessary, the Douglas Aircraft Company had built the largest and most complex aircraft the world had ever seen. Pretty much everything about the XB-19 was record-breaking. With a length of 132.3 feet, a wingspan of 212 feet, and a maximum gross weight of 162,000 pounds, it was the longest, widest, and heaviest aircraft ever built. Going over the full construction details of the XB-19 would probably take this video to well over two hours in length, so to keep things simple I will summarise. If you do want to know more about the design, however, I recommend the book by William Wolfe, which I will link in the description below. Additionally, if enough people ask, I'll look at doing a video analysing the XB-19's construction and compare it to others such as the B-29 and B-36. So, as mentioned already, the length was just over 132 feet and the wingspan was 212 feet. The tail surfaces were equally massive. The horizontal stabiliser had a span of 61 feet, which was the same as the total wingspan of the Douglas A-20 Havoc, and the tip of the fin towered 42 feet above the ground. With ailerons that had a greater span than the wings of most conventional fighters, and with a rudder large enough to warrant its own postcode, it would have been impossible to operate them in the traditional sense. Instead, the pilot's controls operated the control tabs on the respective surfaces, and once the surface was moving, hydraulic pressure would take up the additional work. The maximum gross weight of the aircraft, exceeding 160,000 pounds, presented a challenge in producing the undercarriage. Other larger aircraft of the past had almost exclusively been tail draggers, but Douglas decided to use a tricycle arrangement like that used on their experimental DC-4E. The result was the largest landing gear unit yet designed for an aircraft. The main wheels had a diameter of 96 inches, and the nose wheel had a diameter of 56 inches. The massive tyres were manufactured by Firestone, and they were often featured in numerous promotional articles at the time. Carrying such a package into the air, and for the distances required, would of course take a lot of fuel. In total, the XB-19 could have a fuel capacity of just under 12,000 US gallons. This comprised of approximately 10,300 gallons of fuel housed in the wing tanks, and the rest was made up of two auxiliary tanks that could be placed in the Bombay. This fuel was fed by an electric pump system to the four duplex cyclone engines, which drove massive three-blade propellers. These had a diameter of 17 feet, weighed 700 pounds each, and were at the time the largest to be equipped to any aircraft in the world. 
With the largest wings in the world, the largest landing gear, propellers and fuel systems too, it will come as no surprise that the XB-19's support systems were equally as massive. A vast hydraulic system was used to operate the wheel brakes, landing gear, wing flaps, control surface boosters, Bombay doors, Bombay hoist and the gun turrets. The main electrical system, not counting backups and isolated units, was equipped with a 120 volt, 400 cycle, 60 ampere, 3 phase AC power plant, which was supplied by two engine driven generators that delivered 15 kilowatts. Continuing the trend of big was the cooling system for the engines. Together, the four main oil tanks supplied some 376 gallons of oil, and this system, together with the fuel lines and the engines themselves, could be accessed by a passageway that was built into the wing. This allowed flight engineers to carry out maintenance and emergency repairs during flight, and though very cramped, these passages were at least illuminated by electric lights for the engineers' convenience. Though intended as a flying testbed rather than as an actual bomber, the XB-19 was still fully equipped with bombing in mind. Depending on the mission profile, its planned bomb loads ranged from 11,000 pounds all the way up to 37,100 pounds, the latter coming at the cost of massively reduced range. The bombs could be carried in the bomb bay and on 10 specially mounted wing racks. In its heaviest configuration, the XB-19 could carry 18 2,000 pound bombs, or an equivalent in smaller bombs. Defense would come in the form of 11 machine guns, 6 30 caliber and 5 50 caliber, and two quick firing 37 millimeter cannons. These were spread across 11 gunner stations. Some were manually operated, like the waste guns, and some were installed in complex electrohydraulically driven turrets. Though this did do much to help with the development of gun turrets of US bombers, the XB-19 was actually considered undergunned. The Boeing B-17, which was considerably smaller, had more guns than the XB-19, and as things would turn out, the use of 37mm cannons on aircraft as defensive weapons proved to be an exercise in fantasy, as they were woefully inaccurate and prone to overheating and jamming. Unsurprisingly, such a massive aircraft required a large crew. The XB-19 nominally had a 16-man crew, which consisted of the pilot, co-pilot, aircraft commander, navigator, flight engineer, radio operator, bombardier, and the rest were made up of gunners. For long-range flights, a support crew of two mechanics and six relief crew could also be included. To accommodate such a large crew, the XB-19 was designed to take on the role of a flying house, as well as that of an intercontinental bomber. It had a soundproofed and heated sleeping compartment that contained six permanently installed bunks. It also had a table and four chairs, the latter of which could also be folded up to provide additional sleeping space. After this cabin was the galley, which was provided with utensils, an electric stove, a supply of drinking water, and portable tables. As the XB-19 was designed to be airborne for up to two days, it came with a fully functioning lavatory system, rather than the occasional bucket that some smaller craft were forced to use. These luxurious features, and the numerous other innovations of the XB-19, were first revealed to the American public in September of 1940, when the top secret status of the project was finally lifted. Between then and the completion of the XB-19 in the spring of 41, it was touted by the Air Corps as a gigantic new bomber for American defense. It didn't take long for the media frenzy to take hold, and even before the XB-19's first flight, it was known as the Wonder Bomber, the Super Bomber, the Giant of Santa Monica, and the Guardian of the Hemisphere. The first flight of the XB-19 had been scheduled for May the 17th, with takeoff to commence from Clover Field in Santa Monica, but this was quickly delayed due to problems arising with the aircraft's massive bulk. For ground testing, it had been loaded to its maximum weight of 162,000 pounds, and this weight, concentrated through just three tyres, caused everything underneath it to buckle, break, or otherwise behave in an unstructure-like manner. 
The XB-19's kill count included the concrete ramps leading out of the Santa Monica factory, various pieces of tarmac, then the taxiways and concrete ramps leading onto Cloverfield Runway, and finally the runway itself, which forced a hasty retreat so that workers could first repair the end of the runway, and then also reinforce it with thicker sections. And all of this, by the way, came at Douglas's expense. The black comedy continued when Douglas engineers, having observed their oversized monster sink into the runway of Clover Field from its own mass, looked at the length of said runway, looked back at the giant XB-19, and very quickly broke out into a cold sweat. Following this mass panic attack, the XB-19 was lightened by the removal of the defensive guns and any bulky equipment that could be spared. It was also decided that the first flight would be made with the undercarriage down, and the fuel load was also kept to a minimum. Finally, the adjacent runway at Cloverfield was lengthened at the cost of thousands of dollars, with the undertaking also requiring the grading of a hill and the rerouting of a main street. In the middle of what must have been a chaotic liaison between the Air Corps and city planning, things were further complicated by the discovery that the XB-19's wheel brakes didn't work very well. Various tests had seen problems with acute brake chatter, the shearing of various torque bolts, and the failure of at least two brake spiders. Addressing this issue took several weeks, as stronger parts had to literally be fabricated, and the date of the first flight of the XB-19 was gradually pushed back from May the 17th to June the 27th. On that day, six weeks, numerous modifications, repairs, and 4,000 feet of additional runway later, the XB-19 was rolled out for the main event in front of a crowd of 45,000 people. Unknown to many on that day was the fact that the XB-19 had attained another record. It now had the most expensive aviation insurance policy in the world. Douglas had paid an enormous premium of $84,000 to insure just the first minute of the aircraft's first flight, and then a more reasonable sum of $3,000 per hour of flight testing until the aircraft was to be accepted by the Army Air Corps. Taking off from Cloverfield, the XB-19 was to fly just 22 miles to Marchfield, near Riverside, where it would undergo the first of many test programs. For this flight, the crew was limited to seven, with the controls being in the hands of Chief Pilot Major Stanley Umstead and Co-Pilot Major Howard Bunker. Douglas's chief test pilot and vice president, Carl Cover, was meant to have been in control, but he was suffering from the recurrence of complications from a spinal injury. Escorted by four Curtis P-40 Warhawks, the XB-19 completed its maiden flight with much fanfare, and much like how they handled the original unveiling of the XB-19, the Air Corps took a similar amount of creative license when it came to their press release following the aircraft's maiden flight. According to the Air Corps, the engines were started quickly, and the XB-19 taxied down to the far end of the runway without incident, much to the adoration of the crowd. In reality, the XB-19 had performed its old trick of breaking ground surfaces, and the starboard main wheel had sunk several inches into some asphalt. It took a dozen Douglas engineers with wooden planks and the application of the engines to get it free. According to the Air Corps, the XB-19 couldn't wait to be off the ground, with Major Umstead holding it down as it approached and exceeded 75 miles an hour. Then, when he eased off the controls, it apparently shot off into the sky like a fighter. In reality, when Umstead first pulled back on the controls, nothing actually happened. Then, after more pressure, the aircraft's nose almost couldn't be stopped from pitching up, and Umstead fought for several hair-raising moments to get a stable attitude. And finally, according to the Air Corps, the XB-19 proved remarkably easy to land, and in the words of the flying observer, no actual jar of contact with the ground could be noticed, and it was difficult to know when we had actually landed. The readily available film of this landing, which shows the XB-19 wobbling about on its approach and then violently bouncing along the runway, is clear evidence of the contrary. 
If a less capable pilot had been at the controls, this first landing would probably have been the XB-19's last. As it turned out, part of this instability was a result of the lightening of the aircraft by some 30 tons, the full effects of which could not be fully assessed until it was actually airborne. After landing at Marchfield, the XB-19 immediately became a menace once again by damaging the taxiways and parking apron. This ruled out a suspected problem with the pavement mix used at Cloverfield, and a subsequent investigation would eventually lead to the development of new design procedures to enhance pavement subgrades, ones that are still actually used today. Marchfield marked the beginning of the XB-19's career, not as an intercontinental bomber as proclaimed a year earlier, but as a flying laboratory, a name that the Air Corps now emphasised in its public releases, and one that Douglas mirrored in its company magazine. The armament which had been removed to shed weight was reinstalled, and two tonnes of flight testing equipment was also added. An initial 30-hour test program was agreed upon, with Douglas being obligated to supply both the equipment and the personnel until the Air Corps accepted the aircraft for delivery. The initial flight tests of the XB-19 were both extensive and exhausting, both due to the size of the aircraft and the sheer number of materials, components and systems that needed testing, and due to the problems that naturally arose. As the XB-19 wasn't going into series production, spare parts weren't exactly numerous, and if anything moderately complex broke, it had to be fabricated from scratch. The biggest challenge during these tests proved to be the engine. The R-3350 repeatedly overheated, and because of this the XB-19 was forced to fly with its cow flaps permanently open. This compromised its already modest top speed, and the highest speed it could now achieve was just 204 miles an hour, though its cruising speed was considerably worse at 140. This put the aircraft below the performance guarantees of the contract signed between Douglas and the Air Corps. But as the development of the engine was now vital to the B-29 program, this airspeed performance was disregarded. This period of testing ran until late February of 1942. During that time, only two major events of note occurred. In October, the XB-19 made a dazzling public display at Douglas's new plant at Long Beach, flying less than 100 feet above the crowd, and seven weeks later, the Pacific War erupted at Pearl Harbor. Following this, the XB-19 was quickly repainted in olive drab, and it would carry out all further test flights with trained gunners manning all of the defences. Security on the ground was also tightened up, and access to the aircraft was restricted to keep it as secret as possible. Admittedly, with the XB-19 becoming something of a local tourist attraction due to its vast size, attempts at maintaining even a modicum of secrecy were of course a total failure. By the time the XB-19 was delivered to what was now the Army Air Force in June of 1942, its total cost had reached $4 million, $2.5 million spent by Douglas, and another $1.5 by the government. As a flying laboratory, the XB-19 had completed one of the most extensive test programs in history, providing valuable data that was being put to immediate use in the development of the Boeing B-29. It was especially useful in highlighting the cooling problems with the duplex cyclone engine, something that also plagued the B-29's development, but now that this testing period was apparently over, the Army Air Force quickly realised that it actually had to justify the vast expense of this aircraft to the American taxpayer in a time of war. Their solution was to continue the aircraft's career as a flying testbed. In a press release, the Air Force justified that the $4 million aircraft had already paid for itself with inestimable research data, and that, even in the new state of war, it would be short-sighted to curtail all further research. And so, in January of 1943, the XB-19 left for its new home at Wright Field in Ohio, where its presence was apparently meant to be kept secret. 
Unsurprisingly, hiding the aircraft proved to be an impossible task, both on the ground and more obviously in the air, and the Air Force was once again compelled to make a press release about their giant flying experiment. However, this time, they only provided the local press with the bare minimum of facts, most of them outdated, as the XB-19 was being put through a modernisation programme. This included the installation of Bendix disc brakes to replace the useless drum units, an updated 24 volt electrical system for the controls, new engine starters, auxiliary power plants, heating systems, oxygen systems, an autopilot, revised radio equipment, and, most importantly, an improved electric stove for the galley. Six months later, at the completion of these upgrades, the XB-19 was finally accepted into service with the Air Force, which meant that Douglas finally got paid a mere $1.5 million. Thankfully, they could easily absorb a million dollar loss thanks to the huge production orders for their other aircraft with the company holding contracts for 6,000 SPD dive bombers, 7,500 A-20s, 1,168 C-54s, and a staggering 10,000 C-47s. With Donald Douglas merrily waltzing off into the sunset, free from his money pit at last, the story of the XB-19 ran on to its bittersweet end. Air Force interest in the Allison XV-3420 engine had revived, and it was now being heavily considered as an alternative for the troubled R-3350 in the B-29. The XB-19 was selected as a testbed for the engines in 1943, being given the 2600 horsepower XV-3420-11, which came with turbo superchargers. And with this new power plant installed, it took to the skies again in January of 1944 as the XB-19A. With the change of engine, the cooling problems that had plagued the XB-19 immediately disappeared. The aircraft's performance also significantly improved, with the top speed jumping up to 275 miles an hour at 20,000 feet. Yet despite this marked improvement, the new Allison engine would not go into mass production, and with its temporary role as an engine testbed fulfilled, the XB-19A went back to right to field. Operated by Air Technical Service Command, it was primarily used for a number of extremely high altitude performance tests. These provided data on airframe structures, new airborne equipment, heating systems and power plants. As these tests were directly related to improving strategic bomber design, as the World War reached its climax, the XB-19, for the first time, operated mostly in secret. At the conclusion of these tests, it was finally decided to retire the aircraft from military use. In its last public statement about the XB-19, the Army Air Force's closing remarks were nothing but glowing praise. After flying three years of flight tests without a major mishap, the XB-19 produced mountains of priceless and time-saving data. The B-29 Superfortress was made possible through these efforts. Remarks from the ATSC were equally poignant, with the commander declaring that by providing important engineering and flight data for other big bombers, the XB-19A had contributed more to the war effort than any other single airframe. Because of the vital role it played in the development of the B-29, and the numerous other contributions it made to the development of extremely large aircraft, the XB-19 was one of the few prototypes that could claim to have succeeded after it had failed. Though it never entered production as a frontline aircraft, it still had a huge impact on the future of military aviation. With that in mind, it is a huge shame that this aircraft wasn't preserved. Following its retirement as a testbed, it was converted into what was, for a time, the world's largest transport aircraft. Though it was estimated to be able to carry loads of up to 45,000 pounds, records show that the XB-19A only completed a few local flights in this role. The problem was that it was actually too big to be practically useful, as most airfields couldn't even service it. It was then given over to the all-weather flying centre in Ohio, who also had no real use for it, and the giant aircraft was parked outside at the edge of the facility, out of the way. 
Eventually, the XB-19 found itself back home in California, where it completed its final flight on August the 17th, 1946. This flight took it to Tucson, Arizona, where it was originally intended to have the aircraft placed in secure storage, the end goal being to preserve it as a historic aircraft for the planned National Air Museum. Unfortunately, a few years later, a new base commander decided to have a clear out of older aircraft, ones that he didn't think were historic enough to be preserved, and the XB-19 apparently met this criteria. It did get one last laugh before the end though. A mobile salvage contractor had to be brought in, and the XB-19 proved to be so large that even with chains tied to heavy trucks, they couldn't actually pull it apart. Eventually, cutting torches sliced the aircraft down piece by piece until just the front of the nose remained, having been preserved by the salvage director upon hearing about the aircraft's significance after the fact. Eventually, though, the nose too would be gone, but one part of the XB-19 does remain today, the giant wheels. One is on display at the Hill Air Force Base in Utah, and the other is at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And a big thank you, of course, to the patrons, whose names you'll see here. Now, I know I've done a lot of long videos recently, but moving forward, things should be a bit more balanced, now that I've got some things from my urgent to-do list out of the way. The only exception being the Patreon voted video, which is probably going to be an hour long, if not more. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, and a quick update on my future plans for video layouts, style, etc. has gone up today on Patreon, so please feel free to check that out when you have a moment. But thank you all for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.